love working on puzzles. And I know what you're probably thinking. Wow, Kyle's good looking and likes puzzles. He's like the perfect package. <laughs> yeah. Moving forward, uh, one day my friend Jake rolls up and he's like, hey man, I got this thousand piece puzzle of the Death Star. And immediately I'm like, praise the Lord. <laughs> Save me from another trip to Walmart. And so here we are, you know, we dump out the box, you know, and we're flipping over the pieces. We're getting all the straight edges out. And we're starting to work our way in. You know, and I'm, I'm getting pretty serious about this puzzle. You know, I'm, I'm getting pretty serious. We're, we're going at it. And then we get down to the last three pieces. And there were only two pieces on the table. But if we need three, two, three, it's not the same number. They just, I went to Bible college. We didn't have math, but I knew this much. Three and two are not the same thing. So, obviously there was one missing. Well, we're looking around. I'm looking for this puzzle piece, and I couldn't find it. I'm looking everywhere. I'm, you know, the first place you look for, you look on the table, and it's not on the table. So the next place you look for is under the table. There was a puzzle piece under the table, but for some reason, puzzle night pieces just never got back to the box, so this puzzle piece just didn't fit to our puzzle, which was a little frustrating. You know, so I'm the only guy looking for it. I'm the only person in the group looking for it. Speaking of which, if you guys ever get the pleasure to meet my great friends who, you know, was building this puzzle with me, could you please coordinate with them a way for them to lay me down into my grave so that they can let me down one more time? That'd be great. But so we're looking, we're looking for this puzzle piece, and, you know, I'm going through the cushions. I'm going through the couches. I'm like, where is this puzzle? Where is this piece? I was the one that dumped it all out. Like, so... You know how when you lose something, you try to give yourself like that whole NCIS background where you're like, all right, the first thing I did was go to the bathroom, and then I, you know, turned the, button, the knob this way, and then I used the bathroom, hit the, you know, flush, and then I left, washed my hands, left the room. You know, you're just going everywhere, right? Trying to play back in your head, where could this puzzle piece be? So I'm looking for it, and eventually my friends are like, all right, Kyle, let's just call it a night. You know, we got to go to Walmart, and we like, oh. Surprise. <laughs> but we're, we just give up. And so my friend picks up the box, and lo and behold, the puzzle piece was behind the box. I mean, why would we check under the box? I grabbed the original box, dumped it out, and the lid had the piece. You know, it was just kind of like, I guess it was like wedged in there, you know, like that little lip on the cover. You, guys, you puzzle experts know what I'm talking about. You know. But while I was looking for this piece, it was driving me insane. And I'm not, I'm not like OCD and I don't need everything in the right spot or anything, but the puzzle wasn't complete. I, I, you can't just move on from the puzzle if that one piece is missing. You know, that one piece was important. You know, which got me thinking, how could I overlook that? Why was I such a moron? I don't know. Anyhow. The puzzle piece was important, you know, and, and to, to bring into bigger perspective what this puzzle was, you know, we're all part of this puzzle, right? God designed this church, the church, to be part of a puzzle where each and every one of us, we fit together and we all serve a purpose. Because just like how that one piece completed the entire Death Star, each and every one of us complete the church. And it's not, the picture isn't complete without the one piece. It doesn't matter if it's a corner piece, if it's in the middle Without that one piece, the picture isn't complete. And without any of you, the picture isn't complete. You see, God created the kingdom, God created the church to move in such a way and to be looked at in such a fashion where we would all complement each other, where we would be part of a bigger picture. As a church as a whole, if we're not doing our part, the picture is also incomplete in that way too. If we're not doing our part alongside of everyone, the picture remains incomplete. So how do we play our part in this puzzle? We play our part by meeting people where they're at. And we'll dive into this further. When we serve like that, we create this picture of what God has designed us to be. And maybe we can relate, you know, to the piece that was sitting on the floor. You know, and sure, it didn't really belong to the puzzle itself, 
but we can relate to being on the floor or being that puzzle piece that was set aside. You know, we just sit there, we're this puzzle piece that just sits there, we don't really do anything. While the other piece was on the table, or while this piece was underneath the table, it did nothing, and the picture remained incomplete still. Some of us can re relate to the piece that was stuck in the box, the cover of the box, you know, in inside the box where it's safe. There's no harm to be done. Nothing bad could possibly happen when you're in the box. So you don't leave the box. We don't want to leave it because if we were, it'd be uncomfortable. When it comes to evangelizing to other people, serving people in this capacity, it's easier for us to just sit in the box. While we sit in the box, the picture remains incomplete. What, are we gonna, what we're going to look at today is how we as Christians can do something called whatever it takes. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians 9, chapter, or chapter 9, verses 20 through 23. And this chapter uh, is all about cultural norms. So we're going to look at cultural norms. A cultural norm refers to the patterns of behavior that are typical to a specific group. So I looked online for some cultural norms that we have here in America. Did you know that there are like these cheat sheets for people that, for like international people to come visit America? Like online, there are cheat sheets for that. I, I, copied, a, I copied a couple down. So let me share it with you. Uh, cultural norm number one in America, shake hands. You extend your right hand as the person is extending theirs. You meet and you shake up and down. Just in case you guys didn't know. You know. Number two, in America, it's impolite to burp after a meal. It's not a compliment to the chef. Uh, another cultural norm is waving. This one is very explicit instructions. Hold your hand up with all five fingers extended and move your hand left to right. <laughs> Americans are also hygiene conscious. I don't know where they got this one from. <laughs> no offense or nothing. Um, but they find natural body odors to be disturbing and unpleasant. They generally shower every day, they use deodorant, and they wear freshly laundered clothes. All these things seem painfully obvious to us because... We live in America. You know, if we behaved in these ways in some other countries, we'd probably be looked at as weird or worse, impolite. We expect others to abide by our customs while in our country, but we would want to abide by theirs when in their country, right? You know, to be respectful. The same thing is true to a lesser extent when you're a guest in someone else's home. Think about the number of things you try to pick up on when entering someone's house. Do I take off my shoes? You know, I don't, I don't know. You know, when you're waiting for dinner, what seat, is it okay, which seat is okay for me to take? You know, or maybe when you're waiting for dinner and so you walk into the living room, is there a specific chair that is, you know, only for the host? Like, should I not sit in a specific part of this room? You know, you look for these things. Another thing that we look for, do we pray before we eat? We worry about these things because we'd like to have a nice time with our host. And we don't want to offend anyone. We know that if we were perceived as rude or disrespectful, we probably won't be invited back. The last thing we want after visiting someone else's home is for them to close the door behind us after we leave and remark what a rude person that was. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 20 through 23, Paul addresses a similar problem in the Christian life. He tells us that in order to spread the gospel, he does what he can to fit in. He does whatever it takes. And he has become all things to all men so that, all, so that by all possible means he might save some. Throughout chapter 9, Paul is talking about the rights of an apostle and the freedom that believers have in Christ. We also read that in Galatians 5.18, that if we are led by the Holy Spirit, we are not under the law, that we are in fact set free. In this passage, he points out that we also have the freedom to, to place limits on our freedom, which is exactly what he's done. This is Paul's strategy. Paul's strategy in sharing the gospel is to put limits on his own freedom, because he has the freedom to do so. The biggest, I do what I want in the world. In verses 20 through 22, Paul explains this principle by giving us some examples of how he's given up his own freedom. So verse 20, we'll, we'll start there this morning. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not, my, not being myself under the law, so that I might win those who are under the law. He says to the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. Now, Paul was, by birth, education, and upbringing, a Jew. Excuse me. However, the Jews, 
still believed that salvation had and was in alignment with strict adherence to the old covenant, to the old rituals, the old law. But Paul knew that participation in their festivals and rituals were not required for his salvation. But he also knew that participating in them was not sinful. And if he didn't participate in them, they probably wouldn't have listened to a word that he said. As a matter of fact, they probably would have kicked him out of the synagogue or their homes. So when Paul was with the Jews, he participated with them in their rituals. Next, he says, to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. Probably the people under the law that Paul was referring to were a specific group of Jews. Again, Paul says that though he was not subject to the law, he was free from having to keep it. He subjected himself to it for the sake of the people he was ministering to. In verse 21, Paul says, Though to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law so as to win those not having the law. When he was with people who were not Jews, you know, Gentiles, he knew that they paid no attention to the Old Testament laws. In these situations, it was pointless for him to adhere to these strict celebrations when they didn't even care about it. It, wasn't, it didn't matter to them. Instead, he participated in the things that Gentiles did. Notice that he implies that he wouldn't do anything the Gentiles did because it was still under the law of Christ. He wouldn't do everything the Gentiles did because he was still under the law of Christ. For example, Paul wasn't going to worship at the temple of Diana because that was sinful. But he knew that some of the Gentiles didn't have a problem with some of the meat that they were eating, that Jews would have a problem with. So he indulged in those kind of meats. And to be frank, I don't blame him. He ate it because it allowed him to fit in. And these people, it allowed him to fit in with these people, and it didn't violate the law of Christ. There are two components. Don't violate the law of Christ, try to fit in. In verse 22, to the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I become all things to all men, so that I, might, I may be by all means save some. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. When he was with those who were weak, in other words, those who weren't exactly sure what was permissible and what was not permissible, he didn't do things that would cause him to fall into sin. Some of those people would have balked at eating meat because of past religion and past requirements that would have allowed meat to be sacrificed to various different idols. And so Paul wouldn't eat those meat so that he wouldn't allow them to fall into temptation or even be a stumbling block, if you will. In those cases, Paul simply didn't serve it He tried to accommodate and meet them where they were at. In this case, it would be similar if you or I were to invite someone who was struggling with alcohol over for dinner. Sure, we have the freedom to have a glass of wine, or at least you guys have the freedom to have a glass of wine. I'm still underage. But (laughs) you may have the freedom to do so, but you would exercise your freedom not to have it anyway because you don't want to be a stumbling block. And that was the same kind of mindset that Paul is exuding in this passage. Doing whatever it takes means leaning on the law of Christ. We can't just say whatever it takes and disregard the law of Christ. Like I said earlier, there are two components. Try to fit in and the law of Christ. Note that in all the examples that Paul gives, the guiding principle is that he would participate in their rituals and accommodate them as much as he could, as long as it didn't violate the law of Christ. In other words, Paul was not going to compromise his faith, compromise his value for the purpose of fitting in. Of course, the question is, what is the law of Christ? Galatians 5.18, if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If you're led by the Spirit, we should seek God in prayer about what we should do. Our motivation should be to please God rather than ourselves or others. We also have clear commands given to us through the New Testament, and those too would make up the law of Christ. So the determining factor is whether the, the Bible speaks against something that we want to do. Now, the bigger question, of course, is why would Paul do this? He said that he's free from the rigid guidelines placed upon him by the world, so why would he voluntarily submit to them? A perfect example of this would be in the book of Acts, when he recommended that Timothy be circumcised before going to talk to the Jews. I mean, easy for Paul to say. I mean, come on. That's in Acts 16, 1 through 3, if you guys want to read that later. He said that these men all knew that Timothy's father was Greek, or in other words, a Gentile, and, and that they'd have nothing to do with him because they would perceive him as a Greek an outsider. 
Timothy was not required to be circumcised. He wasn't subject to the Jewish law, but rather to the law of Christ. Yet Timothy was circumcised before going to see the Jews. So why would Paul suggest this? And, why, or, and what could possibly motivate Timothy to submit to this? I mean, it isn't Timothy's problem. It's not Timothy's problem if they don't listen. It's not Timothy's problem if they choose not to listen. So why accommodate? If Timothy's offering to share with them the truth that will set them free, but they aren't willing to, to listen to it, then they deserve what's coming, right? That was, sarc- that was sarcastic, in case you guys didn't. All right. Well, that isn't the attitude that Paul wants. In verses 22 and 23, Paul explains why he gives up some of his freedom. I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. The motivation that Paul and Timothy have is to become part of a culture as much as they possibly could so that others would hear the gospel and be saved. They make it their responsibility to do whatever it takes, to do whatever they can for a chance to share the life-changing message of the gospel. Their reward is to see others understand the experience and and to understand and experience the love of Christ. Doing whatever it takes doesn't mean that we just become chameleons. And let me expand on that. When you read this passage, you, you probably got some red flags. I, I did, you know. You might say, wait a second, are you saying that we just play a part? That we should just pretend to be just like whoever we're around? Are you saying that I should be a chameleon, simply changing the, outside appear- the outward appearance to blend in with my surroundings? Absolutely not. And I don't think that that's at all what Paul is saying either. If you read the rest of this chapter, and if you read the rest of Paul's writings throughout the New Testament, you see that he's always urging Christ-like consistency. He says that we should consistently live for Christ and submit ourselves to his authority. Notice, he doesn't say to the idolaters, I became an idolater, or to the adulterers, I became an adulterer. You know, he, he says that we should try to meet them where they are, to accommodate them, to do whatever it takes to accommodate And by doing that, that's one of the ways that we can gain the right to be heard, like Chris said last week. Now, you might say that this is all well and good, but Paul and Timothy were missionaries in the first century, too. They had a lot of things to do in order to fit in, or else people would have shut them out, or they would have considered them to be blasphemers. They could even risk being killed if they didn't accommodate. You might argue that you're not a missionary, and even if you were, these verses wouldn't apply to you. And if that is your mindset, I would plead with you to to try to change it or try to view it through a different perspective, to try to view your perspective differently as to what your role in the kingdom is. One of the things that missionaries do to foreign countries, even today, is training in how to fit in with their culture, how to fit in with their society. Their reason is the same as Paul and Timothy's. They don't want the fact that they are outsiders to distract anyone from listening to what they have to say. They want to build relationships so that they can earn the right to be heard. The fact is, is that you and I are missionaries too. Before Jesus left the earth, he commanded us to go into all of the world, proclaiming the gospel. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to go to a foreign country per se. We should start right here, right where we're at. We live in America, the melting pot. And if you ever go to the melting pot, it's a little expensive. But... We're going to find ourselves in various different cultures as we attempt to share the gospel. In order for people to listen to what we have to say, we'll have to try to fit in. We'll have to be seen as something other than an outsider. It's just like when we visit someone else's house. You know, we try to be respectful. It's not like when we visit someone else's house, we're pretending to be part of their family, but rather we're just trying to show respect to them because it gives us an opportunity to build a relationship It shows that we care for them, and it opens up for conversation and gives us a chance to really interact with one another. If we went to dinner and said, I have a right to wear my shoes, and, you know, whenever I want, and if you don't want me to wear your shoes, then you shouldn't have invited me, you probably should expect not to be invited again. So if we are to go into the world not as chameleons, but also not as rigid and inflexible people, we are to be a beacon of Christ's love to one another, to all the different classes of people as well regardless of their culture, regardless of any kind of societal affiliation. 2 Corinthians 5.20 reads that we are ambassadors of Christ. That means we go on behalf of Jesus. We represent Jesus. We cannot just, stay, we cannot just sit somewhere and do nothing. 
Because what kind of Jesus does that represent? Do you want people to see a Jesus that just sits around and does nothing? I would hope not. It's important that we look at our actions and how we reflect and embody the statement, I am a Christian. It's important because to some people, you might be the only piece of Jesus that they see. So what kind of Jesus are you showing? What kind of Jesus do you represent? Do you represent a Jesus that doesn't show love to all people? Do you represent a Jesus that gets angry on the snap of a finger or a drop of a hat? What kind of Jesus do you represent with the statement, I am a Christian? Does the, Jesus you show peop- the, the, does the Jesus that you show people show prejudice? What kind of person you are when you say you're a Christian reflects what kind of Jesus you have faith in. And I urge you to be cautious with that. Paul encountered a few different classes, Jews and Gentiles, weak and strong, and we have a number of different classes as well. We have Republicans and Democrats and everything in between and beyond. We have sports fans and non-sports fans And Lord bless those Virginia fans, right? Right? Too soon, I guess. We have those who work the night shift, those who work the day shift, those who stay at home. We have a seemingly infinite number of different classes of people, and in nearly every case, we can respect and accommodate them, earning the right to be heard. We have the freedom to serve them and to meet them where they are, to build relationships and show them who Jesus is. So what would this principle look like today? With all the different people groups that we encounter, it would be nearly impossible for us to show the whatever-it-takes mentality to everyone, right? Well, that may be true. However, I think we do already a good job at picking up on the cultures around us. With those people who are our friends to those that we find value and respect, those we make every effort uh, to find out what is important, we try to ensure that we do things that are pleasing rather than offensive. You know, we see that mentality when it comes to our family. You know, we don't want to do anything that they don't like. We want to avoid those things. You do this with your boss. You know, you want to please your boss. You don't want to make them angry. When we see a person as valuable, we make an effort to understand that person's culture, to know what makes them tick, and try to meet them where they are. So why don't we act like that all the time? What is it that keeps us from really listening to a person, from working to build a relationship with them? Why do we take a defensive stance against so many people? I think the problem that we face there is that there are a number of people that we just don't see as valuable. And because we don't see them as valuable, we don't think it warrants them any effort. Why? Well, to be honest, I think it's because we think they have nothing to offer us. And when it's put so bluntly, I mean, yeah, sure, you'd be opposed to it, but in reality, we think that way. Someone doesn't have something to offer me, therefore I'm not going to spend that much time with them. So how do we look at people differently? Because to be honest, if we were to continue and view people like that, it would be a little rude. Maybe not a little. It would just be rude. So how do we move beyond self-seeking and rude to being self-sacrificing and being willing to do whatever it takes for the gospel? The way that we can begin to do whatever it takes is to not look at people that we interact with on daily basis Uh, on on the daily as means of what they can offer us. We shouldn't assign value to people based on what they can give us. Instead, we need to look at people that we encounter every day and see a person that God created. The way that we can view people in this way is how we'll treat people. We need to see a person who needs the forgiveness that Jesus can give. And rather than saying, what can they give me? We need to say, what can I give you? Because I have something that will turn your life into something better. I can give you the eternal gift through Jesus Christ. When we view people in this way, we'll start to understand them, or at least try to understand them, to know what they like and what they don't like, to see the concerns and the obstacles that come between them and a relationship with God. We'll start to embrace the whatever it takes. Speaking of whatever it takes, on January 13th, 1982, the Boeing 737-200 crashed into the 14th Street Bridge over the Potomac River. The aircraft struck the 14th Street Bridge, which carries the Interstate 395 between Washington, D.C. and Arlington County, Virginia. The aircraft was carrying 74 passengers and five crew members. Four passengers and one flight attendant survived from the crash. Passenger Arlen D. Williams, Jr. assisted in the rescue of the survivors. 
Whenever the rescue copter hovered over the body of water, hovered over the survivors, he continually swam as fast as he could, grabbing the rope and and swimming over to the next person, handing the rope over. And he would continue to do this. But before the copter could get back to Arlen, when he was the last survivor, Arlen drowned. I wonder what it was like to be Arlen in that moment. To do whatever it looked, to do whatever it took, to look at everyone and say, "I'm going to do whatever it takes." To so those people, and say, "I don't care what you've been, where you've been, what you've done, what you look like, what you sound like. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to bring you a lifeline." I wonder what it's like to to view people in the heat of the moment like that. And I would pray that none of us ever have to experience something like that. But to embrace the whatever it takes mentality means to do whatever it takes. Arlen could have stayed where he was at. He could have waited for someone else to do the job. I mean, the Coast Guard did come rescue them. It was their job. He could have just waited for them to do their job. But he knew he had the ability to save some. Every day there are people drowning. And you have the lifeline. You have the ability to bring them a lifeline. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Whenever I read the Bible, I read about a Jesus that does whatever it takes. That does whatever it takes to meet people where they are. Whether it's at a well, on the corner of a street, I read about a Jesus that does whatever it takes. So what I ask you, what Jesus do you represent? In your actions, in your statement, I am a Christian, does that show the Jesus that does whatever it takes?